This video is brought to you in part by Harry's. More on them in a bit. So earlier this year, I made a video looking at some of the home console versions of the early Sims games and how wild some of their unique story modes were. And I didn't intend to come back. That is, until a handful of you pointed out a gap in my research. See, I just assumed the PSP version of The Sims 2 was like the other PSP ports in the series, functionally identical to the PS2 or Wii versions of those games, just with graphical compromises. Turns out, no, no, it's as different as could possibly be. It's a story-focused adventure game featuring, among other things, a bovine cult with a villain that can control every Sim's actions with a simple request. Think Bioshock two years before Bioshock. It's a game with a fourth wall plot about the age agency of Sims and the inherent evil of us, the player. With ghosts, vampires, trash donuts, disembodied robot wife, bathtub glizzy, and with a goth GF you can plow in a gas station. So uh, ahead of its time, yeah. I'm not exaggerating when I call The Sims 2 PSP the most batshit Sims game, maybe, to ever exist. Funnily, the only ones that really give it a run for its money are The Sims 2's other handheld ports, a Game Boy Advance version where you're the only actor who knows they're filming a reality show inside an otherwise real town, with a director insane enough to set up alien invasions, or cause nuclear power plant disasters, or even launch actual asteroids at the town for ratings. And then there's the, at this point, legendary Sims 2 DS, an eerie hotel management slash adventure game that takes place using a real-time clock that clued thousands of kids into the concept that we now refer to as liminal spaces. What's more, these three games take place in what seem to be three parallel universes of the same town, named Strange Town, with characters and features that cross over between all three games, only adding to this trifecta's unique aura. Once I started going down this rabbit hole, I just couldn't stop. And it's all your fault, so so thanks for that. These are The Sims 2's handheld spin-offs. In my opinion, the craziest Sims games we may ever see. We're gonna start with The Sims 2 on PSP, because despite performing the best of these three versions sales-wise, it's the one I see talked about the least. There's a reason I assumed it was just a PS2 board after all. Now, all three of these versions were developed by a subsidiary of Amaze Entertainment that went on and off by its own studio name, the amazing name, Gryptonite, a company that almost exclusively focused on handheld ports, licensed games, or handheld ports of licensed games. From some of the DS Crash and Spyro games, to Narnia, to Marvel, to an Age of Empires DS game, you name it and flip a coin, if it comes up heads, it was probably these folks. Like always, you begin by creating your sim, and in the spirit of tradition here, that means that I had to make another Cosma family descendant. Uh. The customization options are naturally more limited, so I had to go with Himbo Ganondorf Cosma. Yeah. The story opens up with Ganon here winding up stranded at a random gas station in the middle of the desert when his car breaks down shortly after a UFO sighting that looks a lot like the little green plumbob diamond hovering over Sims' heads in the main games, the thing you use to control them. Immediately, The Sims 2 PSP stood out to me thanks to some consistently funny dialogue. Your first conversation is with the mechanic Oscar Del Fuego, who demands respect rather than money if he's gonna fix your car. Here and throughout the game, you've got the option to pull out some really sassy responses too. You don't really have many dialogue options, but most of the time when you're pressing X to respond with the only option, it's still great. Oscar's ranting about how you wouldn't walk up to Michelangelo and just throw money at him for the Mona Lisa, and you can just point out that the Mona Lisa wasn't made by Michelangelo, to which he says, yeah, he didn't paint it because he got no respect, and then he asks you to pay him anyway. Incredible. Now, the main gameplay loop in all three of these Sims 2 versions isn't your usual Sim gameplay. It's a string of conversation matching games where you chat with, flirt with, or intimidate any of the Sims in any of these versions of Strange Town. So, where in other games you would see the little dialogue bubbles over characters' heads and watch as your Sim either did or didn't have a good chat without really being able to control it, here you match those bubbles together with either the same image that pops up or a corresponding one. If they say astronaut, you might say spaceship. In the PSP version's case, you'll have a set number of terms to completely fill up the meter in the top right, or else you'll fail the minigame and have your sim's motivation go down. Faster responses, a higher charisma stat, and higher motivation meters will fill it much quicker, which speeds up this game's admittedly limited grind tremendously. 
At first, there are characters you can't possibly succeed at chatting with and befriending, but by the time you reach level 10 charisma, it'll only take one conversation to go from just meeting them to becoming their best friend. At least that's with regular talking. For some reason, Himbo Ganon Kazuma is a god at flirting, which is good because this game asks you to sleep around a lot sometimes. Like the main Sims games, your character has skill levels, charisma, body, logic, creativity, cooking, and mechanical in this game's case. And in many cases, it'll either help to, or you'll need to, get these stats to a certain level to progress. Later in the game, for example, you need a high creativity stat to make a fake ID for an alien teenager to escape Area 51 so that he can get into bars. I... this game is A+. Training each skill is about the same as the other mainline Sims games too. Reading books, talking into a mirror, watching the cooking channel and crying. Same, man. Same. And of course, it wouldn't be a Sims game without having to juggle that day-to-day -day life grind with your Sims' aspirations and needs. Here, however, your needs are slightly different from your main Sims affairs. They're called urgencies. You've got your usual hunger, bladder, hygiene, comfort, but instead of stuff like energy or social, we've now got nausea and headache, which require you to use a medicine cabinet to fix. If your urgencies drop, your Sims mood does as well, but in The Sims 2 PSP, this is part of a whole different mechanic called sanity. If your sanity drops too far, your performance in those conversation minigames does as well, meaning you'll have to do more minigames to actually get best friend status. And if you let your sanity meter drop too low, your character goes insane and is arrested and or fined. Completing aspiration goals and finishing story missions keeps the meter filled and also rewards a different set of sanity points, a currency which you can use to buy special perks. There are some passive perks that greatly slow down your needs so that you don't need to sleep or eat or self-medicate as much or as frequently. There are ones tied to whichever of the three aspirations you picked for your sim at the start of the game. In my case, Ganondorf was a knowledge sim, so I could learn to read minds and get sim secrets without even having to talk to them, or I could intimidate faster with special bullying skills like setting them on fire, or I could just meditate to replenish Ganondorf's sanity meter rapidly at the cost of him soiling himself. There's even a simple crafting system built into the game to make one-use perks like a rose to increase your relationship stat with a character, or a colostomy bag. Uh, Ganondorf, he, uh, he, he, he needs one. Altogether, these systems serve like a more direct RPG light rather than the constant sim management that you're probably used to with these games. The whole managing your need to sleep or eat or shower and all that, they're minor inconveniences at worst in The Sims 2 PSP, almost as if they felt this was obligatory, and the game gives you ways to make urgencies a complete non-issue as you strengthen your character with those skill upgrades and perks. Anyway, in order to make the 500 bucks you need to pay Oscar for your car repairs, Ganon goes into the nearby gas station to talk to Bella Goth, a cop, and the cashier of this gas station, or as she calls it, her curio shop. And by talk, again, I mean rail. See, the shopkeep and a few other characters later will actually pay really good money if you buddy up with the other sims in Strangetown and learn their deepest, darkest secrets. Pretty much the easiest way to make money in Sims 2 PSP is selling these gossips and secrets. Should have named my guy Harvey Levin Kazuma. Almost every sim in the game has four secrets, one for maxing out each of the three conversation minigames with each character, and another one that's tied to the story. Now, I say almost because there are about a dozen generic towny sims that don't affect the story and thus only have the three conversation-based secrets. Actually, what's neat is you can go in and customize these towny sims if you like, so you could base them on your friends, and actually, you could even link your save file with a friend and trade some of the secrets that you have or that they have to save time in unlocking all of them. These secrets are also pretty hilarious at times, whether it's acknowledging the strange, Sims-wide lore that Bella Goth in-universe was abducted by aliens and replaced in her family with a different Bella Goth. That's a, it's a whole story that goes as far back as, I want to say, Sims 1. You should look it up, it's really weird. Or a character losing his legs in a freak stapler accident. There are also a number of more general secrets of the universe hidden as collectibles throughout the game world that reveal that, for example, the Roswell crash was, in fact, a weather balloon, but it was an alien weather balloon. Or maybe my favorite secret across this entire game, water torture is generally ineffective since water doesn't really have anything to hide. It's all very cute. Sometimes when you sell a sim secret though, that sim will somehow find out and get mad at you, and if you want to talk to them again, which you sometimes need to do for story purposes, they'll either make you apologize at the cost of one friendship level, which is easy enough to get back anyway, no big deal, or you can save time and bribe them. 
honestly, that's the better option. Sims in Strangetown are surprisingly cheap. It usually costs like maybe two bucks to pay them off. Anyway, who cares about their secrets? We need to get our car back. So Ganondorf Kazuma makes his way around the gas station, sleeping with, high-fiving, and yelling at all three of the patrons nearby, and selling their secrets to the weird voodoo gas station lady, only to find out once he's made the 500 bucks that Oscar, his repair shop right behind the gas station, and your car have all vanished from the face of the earth. Just up and disappeared. Ganon gets a call from the mysterious Dr. Nulo telling you to head to Strangetown proper, but first you need a house and a ride there. Bella Goth will sell you her mansion for however much money you have on you, because she says it's haunted and she wants nothing to do with it, so I bought a bunch of protein bars to waste all that money and then gave her seven dollars. And because of that, I never needed to eat for the entire rest of my playthrough. I'm not kidding. And the cop agrees to drive you into town if you can persuade the voodoo cashier, who was also his teacher that he had a crush on back in elementary school, that's a whole story beat that I guess is just in this game, if you can convince her to tell you the location of her secret donut stash. It's in the bathroom trash can. She hides, she hides donuts in the garbage. You know what, whatever, sure. We're in the neighborhood of Paradise Place now, the second of this game's four hubs. And this is where the game goes from quirky to something, honestly, kinda special. The cul-de-sac has five houses, all surrounding and also on top of an ancient burial site, where at night, if you need extra cash, you can play Whack-A-Zombie to stop the undead invasion. Each of the other four houses here have their own mysteries to solve, and really, yours does too. There's a weird nerd named Isaac who asks you to plow his wife because she's sad, which ends up revealing to Ganon that the wife is a subservient robot that Isaac made. That quest ends with us uploading a virus into her code at her request so that she can obtain free will. Or there's the suspicious scientist couple hiding the garbage man in their testing lab. Each half of this couple is paranoid that their spouse is hiding something from them, and after railing both of them, there's really a lot of woohoo in this game, you find out that the wife is already cheating on the husband, and the husband hit a patent filing, which causes an argument long enough for you to sneak into the lab and save the garbage man. And my favorite of the four, there's the mystery of Hazel Dente, the gold-digging wife whose first four husbands died under increasingly suspicious circumstances. Her new rich fiancé gives you a bunch of odd jobs to do around the house for extra cash, such as making him some hot dogs, cleaning the bathroom, or tending the garden. And in each of these, you'll find suspicious items, like a wedding ring in the sink, or a note in the freezer from one of the dead husbands saying his wife is starving him, or a buried pacemaker. Now, you might think that Hazel's murdering her husbands, but it turns out that she blacks out every time as if some outside force is controlling her, only to find out when she comes to that each husband died in mysterious circumstances. Somebody pulling the ladder out from the pool, one husband disintegrating when using the toaster, one getting his hand stuck in a blender. But let's go back a bit. When you first get into your mansion, you'll find that the goth GF wasn't lying. There are, in fact, ghosts here, including the friendly ghost of a maid who will cook for you and mostly negates the need for you to raise your cook skill at any point throughout the game. It's trying to free each of these tortured spirits that sends you on your quest to begin with. One was an earlier test subject from that weird science couple. One was the husband that drowned. The house functions themselves, like a lot of the Sims aspects of this Sims game, are pretty scaled back here on PSP. Although you can decorate and buy furniture, you can't redesign the rooms themselves, only their wall and floor patterns. And because you can sleep, eat, or shower in just about any house, as long as they actually have a bedroom, kitchen, or bathroom at least, some of these sims live like animals, there's not a huge reason to return to your little base of operations, except early on when your skills are low. I chose to do the skill grinding early to make the rest of the game as smooth as possible, so I really didn't spend much time in the house. As you solve each of the mysteries of your house's ghosts, in turn learning the secrets and finishing missions involving three of the other four neighbor houses, you'll discover that Dr. Nulo is actually the evil Dr. Dominion, a mad scientist that discovered he was being controlled by that mysterious green diamond, and he reverse-engineered it to control the others in Strangetown. In other words, he became someone who's playing The Sims himself. He even manipulates your own list of wants and needs, changing all of them to force you to do his bidding by kidnapping that guy's robot wife from earlier so that Dr. Dominion can use her newly hacked brain to take over the desires of every Sim in the world. This leads our noble hero Ganondorf Kazuma to the third area, the foggy, western-looking ghost town of Dead Tree, where we once again solve a bunch of Sims' problems, this time with the overarching goal of finding all of the robot wife's scattered body parts. 
In Dead Tree, among other things, Ganon becomes a vampire by accident, goes line dancing in a bar, plows a lady inside a church to find out the story of her dead ancestors, uncovers that one of the sims in this town is secretly a monstrous night beast, pays for that night beast's anger management classes after revealing to the world that she is in fact a werewolf or whatever, and infiltrates a bovine cult in order to summon their holy cow named Beelzebeef. The colostomy bag from earlier is useful here, by the way, because doing the cow dance requires a strong bladder. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. However, once we've finished up all of the quests in Dead Tree, we've only reassembled Robot Wife's body. We're still missing the most important part, her head, and that forces Ganon to head to the secret military base nearby, Division 47. Conveniently, the cow cult leader has a cousin who happens to work there, so you can just, you can just walk right in, I guess. Once again, some of the sims in both Dead Tree and this military base are just a plus. The girl that's also a night beast has a secret about how she gave up college to pursue her dream of sitting at home, wishing she'd gone to college. I, I love that so much. The weird floating reporter is implied to be the same character as a reporter in the GBA version of The Herbs, also developed by the same studio, Gryptonite. The cult leader pretty much exclusively sits in the bathroom, alternating between the toilet and the tub. That has nothing to do with the story, I just, I want to know why he only lives in the bathroom. It, it actually bothers me. I He's gotten in the way when I need to pee. Or shave. With the sponsor of today's video, Harry's. Didn't see that one coming. Gotcha! So if you're anything like me or Ganon here, your dad never really taught you how to shave, and you just kind of winged it not knowing what to get or what was good. Thankfully, Harry's is here to do what your dad didn't, providing an affordable line of razors and grooming products. They probably won't teach you how to drive, though, either, I asked. So years ago, I learned very quickly that my beard grows in a few different directions and always ends up with me shaving against the grain no matter what, so my puny baby skin always found a way to get bad, bad razor burn, and usually a lot of cuts as well. I haven't used a normal razor in years, opting for an electric boy, so I'll be real with you, I hesitated at first, but Harry's genuinely provided the least irritating razor I think I've experienced, and that's while I was shaving on camera. No razor burn even without using Harry's post-shave balm. Genuine testimonial here, I was amazed. And, and then I went to film more b-roll and nicked my neck like an idiot, but, but that was my fault. Well, probably my dad's fault, but still no razor burn somehow. Anyway, it made for a much smoother shave than I've had ever since I put down the normal razors, to the point that you'd expect this thing would cost a pretty penny. But Harry's manufactures its blades right in their own factory in Germany, where they've been making razors for years and years now, giving you a factory direct price that doesn't compromise on quality. Other blades out there may be more expensive, but they're charging more because they can, not because they should. What you see here is their trial set, usually $13, but if you use my exclusive link here, you can get it for only $5. Doing so helps support a great product, it may or may not make your dad come back, probably not, and you'll be greatly supporting the channel too, so make sure to visit harrys.com TGB to grab your $5 trial set. Thanks again to Harry's for sponsoring this video, and now, let's get back to it. Once Ganon made his way into the military black site, he immediately walked into the barracks and showered alongside an alien and his human mom, then plowed the mom, the alien's sister, and a military general in front of that alien before making a fake ID on a military computer in front of that general so the aforementioned alien could escape and get drunk in Dead Tree. To be, to be totally fair, some of that wasn't required, sometimes the game just wants you to befriend somebody, not necessarily f*** him, but when the mom and the son showered together in front of Ganondorf, he, he just kinda, he had to show dominance, cause that's really weird. Plus, the general slash lover made Ganon clean the toilets with his tongue to cover up their affair, which is, I, maybe a, maybe a commentary on don't ask, don't tell? I, it's not a good one, but it's there. This last area isn't quite as interesting quest-wise as the first two. I mean, you do rescue an alien baby kidnapped by the government, and there's some fourth wall explanation that the little exclamation point quest icon above some of the characters' heads, that the ones that are, you know, giving you a quest, is actually a hologram also invented by the government, but we're in the home stretch at this point. Well before you get to Division 47, you'll already have gotten a bunch of the perks to make your urgencies a non-factor, so most of the game has been running around, reading funny dialogue, and then playing the same repetitive conversation minigame over and over and over with each and every character until you get what you need to move on. It's honestly kind of a shame that The Sims 2 PSP never tries to stretch that conversation idea any further past the surface, because other variants on the chatting minigame could have done a lot to limit the tedium rather than, you know, just making it so that you have to do the same thing fewer times to progress when that is pretty much the only thing you do the entire game. You're still doing it either way. 
Instead, the entire loop that is The Sims 2 PSP is read funny dialogue when there's a story mission involved, play the same communication minigame a few times with each character, occasionally look for an item or a clue somewhere in town, and if you're bored, do one of the side jobs which are all simple Simon Says kind of minigames. After fooling Dr. Dominion's computer by solving a quiz about the events of the game up to this point, you get his teleporter device, which lets you teleport to the final battle. Here you'll find Oscar and your car just kind of chillin' for no real reason, and you go head to head with Dr. Dominion. Dominion has a whole speech about how the player's sim is being mind controlled by you, the player, and how he was so depressed when he was under somebody's control himself and forced to grind in the sim cycle of studying, working, buying, and never doing anything that he himself wanted to do. The doctor starts ranting about all the horrible stuff that sims have done over the years because of their horrible players, stuff like making small closed off rooms and setting them on fire, or pulling the ladders out of pools, before your sim starts retorting about how the doctor himself is just a scripted character and that assuming that he could have free will is part of what he's written by the developers to say. It starts off with the same pretty interesting commentary about Sims players, but then quickly devolves into being about as meta and fourth wall as you can possibly get, all dumped on you all at once after the game had done a far less forced job of teasing that whole free will theme throughout the story up to this point. And there's not much of a final boss fight either, you just need to have the skill levels high enough to pull the milkers off of Beelzebeef, free Robot Wife's head from the machine it's trapped in, and bully Dr. Dominion in a conversation minigame before winning a Dragon Ball Z-styled energy tug-of-war cutscene for control of the green diamond that's controlling all of us. Dominion explodes and is sucked into another dimension, presumably, then you grab the mind control helmet and you're teleported back to Isaac's house to give him his robot wife's head, where there's another meta conversation after this implying that Isaac is Sims series creator Will Wright, and then the game just kind of ends. You can go back to the mind control device and change your sim between any of the three aspiration types in order to change your available perks and goals, and you can learn every last secret in town, but there's no special ending for doing that as far as I can tell. It's maybe just a little bit of a wet fart after such a constant string of chaos and compelling chaos up to that point. The game does build up to the ending well, but I've glossed over a whole lot of these same button matching conversations with the same four or five images to get there. The game is at its best when it's making you explore a haunted graveyard or have actual dialogue convos with the NPCs, not the minigame ones, because that's where you get all of the tongue-in-cheek writing that makes the skill grinding in the same repetitive minigame worthwhile. So for it to end pretty abruptly without any real answer as to what happens to the villain, and for the only remaining thing to do after that to be do the same minigame another hundred plus times to get every last secret, it makes you want just a tad more. That said, it's not like the grind is excessively long, The Sims 2 PSP is only about 6 or 7 hours depending on if you get stuck on any one objective or what the game wants you to do. It's sort of the running nitpick I have with all three of these games. They're each such a fever dream that when they end without much fanfare, even the longer ones, I'm left wanting a bit more. Again, the writing's variety is so strong that the lack of any real variety elsewhere feels like a missed opportunity. This is something that The Sims 2 on Game Boy Advance does struggle a bit less with, but at the cost of being much more of a grind to play. Perhaps it helped the team that this was the third GBA Sims game they'd worked on, where The Sims 2 PSP was a whole new challenge for a newer system with a newer expectation from players. In 2003 and 2004, Gryptonite slash Amaze Entertainment produced GBA versions of The Sims Busted Out and The Herbs Sims in the City, as well as an enhanced and upgraded DS version of the latter of those two, before releasing the GBA and DS Sims 2 ports day and date with the console release in October 2005, and dropping the PSP version only about six weeks later. So in three years, not counting every non-Sims game the studio developed, and not counting stuff like the N-Gage version of Busted Out, which does in fact exist, or that enhanced DS version of the Herbs GBA, they worked on five different story-based Sims games, with three different versions coming in 2005 alone. Before we dive in, Gryptonite's GBA versions of Bustin' Out and The Herbs actually function as their own contained duology, with a story that sort of carries over from one into the other. And like The Sims 2 PSP, they're closer to an RPG than a life sim. The story beats in those other two games are also pretty insane in their own right, probably the only thing in the series that can give any of these three Sims 2 versions a run for their money. Now I decided not to dig into those two games today, mainly because my good pal Minimi already did it better than I could. He's got an excellent video slash Descent into Madness into all three GBA Sims games if you want more of an idea of those two. 
Ugh, okay, I said a nice thing about Mini, now it's time to expose him as the fraud he is. I think God of War sucks. But because those first two games are already dozens of hours long somehow, even with sped up emulation, Mini spent a bit less time with The Sims 2 on GBA, so I figured since I was looking at the PSP and DS games already, I might as well complete the trilogy and give this one a full playthrough. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, Sims 2 GBA takes place in a parallel version of the same Strange Town featured in the PSP and DS versions, and Strange Town itself is also just the name of one of the pre-built neighborhoods in the PC version of Sims 2, so if you want to go deeper, there are four parallel units universes here. The Game Boy Strange Town is by far the biggest of them all, with several shops, a factory, a nuclear power plant, a mine that's home to the mole people, an Egyptian burial ground, it's pretty packed. The story here might be my favorite conceptually of the three as well. A mogul named Daddy Big Bucks, incredible name, casts you as the lead actor in a hidden camera reality show about the real town of Strange Town, and sets you up with a bunch of episode scripts that you have to set into motion by essentially manipulating the rest of the town's unknowing real citizens who are just normal people. Well, they're people. I, I wouldn't call them normal, actually. A lot of what would become the base of the PSP game's production seems to be derived from the systems set up in those earlier GBA games, and align pretty closely with The Sims 2 GBA here. For example, most of the gameplay in this game is a chat minigame, albeit a different one. Also different is that you only have four of your usual needs in this game, which I call the four H's. Hunger, hygiene, asleep, and have to shit. Well, I, I guess thirst is technically separate from hunger, but I already put the trademark filing in, so it's too late. And as you'd probably expect, your sim customization options are even more scaled back given the handheld we're talking about here. So without many options, I created Gold Mario Kazuma, and thinking it would be a good idea to make him a sex god like his cousin Ganondorf, I chose Romance as his aspiration type. Where most Sims games give you knowledge, social, or money as your goal options, here your aspirations are based on the three chat types, friendly, romance, and intimidation. It, uh, it didn't occur to me at the time that this was an early 2000s game on a Nintendo system, and that Gold Mario, being a male, would only be able to flirt with specific female neighbors. This is actually, believe it or not, a little bit important later. Although the game seemingly was originally planned to have somewhere around 20 distinct episodes, somewhere in production we'll call it a writer's strike. This was scaled back to just 11 episodes spread across three quote-unquote seasons, 12 episodes if you count the tutorial. If you didn't have friends with a copy of the game, it would only be 10, because after the finale, there's a bonus reunion episode that is only unlocked by linking two GBAs together. So all in all, about half of what was initially plotted. After explaining your job to you, Daddy Big Buck sends you out of the production room, which is hidden in the basement of your new house. Everything from here is TV related. Your goals are now called plot points, Daddy Big Bucks will call you in your hidden earpiece sometimes to tell you it's time to cut to a commercial, which takes the form of a minigame, it's all very cute. What's a little bit less cute is the house he sets up for you because it's empty. All, all he gets for you is a toilet, which the alien delivery guy promptly christens first by pinching a radioactive loaf. Dude doesn't even flush afterwards, he just makes you clean it. What a dick. My second mistake with Gold Mario Kazuma after making him a romance sim was assuming that this would be like the other Sims 2s, and that beds would be freely available in other places for use, so I bought the shower and the refrigerator, leaving me $10 short on a bed. It turns out there are few, if any, other usable beds in town. I never had another opportunity to buy that cheap bed because the shop rotates between random stock every in-game day, so I just kind of had to let Gold Mario die whenever he got sleepy. With how tight this game is with money, and with how long it takes for inventory in this shop to rotate, I can't even imagine that as a really, really bored kid, I would have ever even tried to furnish my house here. The customization stuff could have been removed entirely, and the game would probably be better for it. A lot of that sort of issue isn't the case in the other two GBA Sims games, by the way. If one of your Sims needs pops up without notice, you have so little time to react. It's often impossible to get to somewhere that has food or a sink before your performance meter at the bottom depletes and you pass out. Which brings you back to the house anyway with no real penalty most of the time, so at that point it's just easier to keep dying than go and manually walk back to your house when you're going to be there anyway. This wasn't a great recipe for success with The Sims 2 GBA, because the performance meter is even more tied to the conversation minigames here than the sanity meter was in The Sims 2 on PSP. Instead of playing a simple matching game, the GBA conversations play out more like an RPG battle encounter. Like a, like, like a bad one though, think early Pokemon with the paltry catch and hit rates. Each of the three combo minigames has five different attacks, only two of which are unlocked from the get-go. Some have a higher success rate at the cost of filling the game's minigame meter less, others are less likely to hit but have a greater payoff. 
The game doesn't actually tell you which ones do what though, you've just gotta figure that out by practice. And you'll want to practice to be fair, because succeeding at these actions enough times allows you to level up each one to a max of level 3, further increasing their success odds. A, a little bit, not really by much though. Is this how sociopaths look at conversation, by the way? Just as a, a skill to level up? The part that sucks about this is even the moves that have the highest chance to hit, the ones that you can only unlock later on anyway usually, still have a pathetic hit rate. Since every failed attack lowers your performance meter, you only have a handful of tries before you fail the minigame, at which point you then pass out from the empty performance meter and respawn once again all the way back at your house, and then you have to walk all the way back to wherever the objective was. It's a crapshoot, even when it's required to progress. My third mistake with Gold Mario Kazuma was assuming that if I leveled up the friendship stats and whatnot with certain characters early in the game, it would mean that I'd be skipping some speech checks later because I already hit the required level to pass that part of the quest. It does not. It just means that when you're told to do a friend chat, it takes way longer to fill the meter because now they're a higher friend level, and that takes a lot more of your performance meter every time you inevitably miss with an attack, so it, it actually it, it is worse to grind and play this game uh, in a way that makes sense. The Game Boy Advance version of this game being a grind is more of a recurring theme than the in-game show ever has from episode to episode, because the episodes are all pretty disjointed. Which honestly is fine, I'm more disappointed about the grind part, because the actual story beats themselves are once again the highlight. The first season of episodes has you find a briefcase with likely illegal contents dropped by mobster Jimmy quote-unquote THE Neck in one episode, his name has quotes over the word THE, I, I love it, as well as finding a hidden mole king and choosing whether or not to turn him into the FBI when he simply wants to keep digging in the mines to give his rat friends a place to live, and sussing out an alien invasion first by foiling their disguises and then by shooting them all with a water gun because they're weak to water. Season 2 features episodes about Strangetown's nuclear power plant going critical and blacking out the city for a while, or helping out a woman because her perfume makes everybody fall in love with her, or a product placement focused episode with a new flavor of cola, which ends up shrinking you down into another shooter level where you have to kill a bunch of ladybugs and then drink a different kind of cola to escape. The variety, sometimes, is impressive. All of these episodes will take you through sometimes nonsensical plot points, and every time, you don't really tend to mind it because it's so absurd that you just can't tell what's coming next. For the perfume episode, for example, the mayor Honest Jackson, great name by the way, asks you to foil the other's plans for wooing the girl with the magical perfume, which of course means you obviously need to spy on them with a stargazing telescope, drown a fuzzy beetle so that its hair sheds and looks gross because one guy is planning on giving it to the girl as a gift and the fuzzy version looks cute and the, the hairless version looks disgusting, I guess. Then you have to give an alien expired makeup from 20 years ago so that he turns invisible, and eventually you shoot the perfume into space because she's tired of being uh, harassed by everybody. The episode stories just go wherever they want. It's incredible. That's reality TV for you. When you complete an episode, you'll get a rating score out of 100, depending on if you've found and completed the hidden want in that episode, a secret B-plot of sorts, or if you found the errand that one of the townsfolk will ask you to do, usually delivering an item to another character randomly throughout the town, or if you've completed one to five of your aspiration conversations. Remember how I made Gold Mario's aspiration romance? Well, that's the one that's least used as far as the episode's requirements go. You're only really ever going to intimidate or chat with people, meaning that it's the one that will always be the weakest and thus the most likely to fail when you play the flirt minigame. Getting five successes in each episode to get that extra 25 ratings points would mean trying again and again, dying again and again, spawning back at the house again and again, and repeating again and again until the RNG finally ended up in my favor, so I didn't max out too many episodes. Thankfully, this being a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts meant that I didn't care to waste my time buying more than one of the other romance moves using those ratings points. Instead, I focused on the friendly and intimidation ones, the ones that you actually need. You can also spend ratings to change the decoration of your house to a more intimidating, romantic, or friendly palette swap. I'm not sure if that actually has an effect or increases your success odds or anything, but it's, it's there, at least. And you can buy two plot twists, which is how you unlock the Alien Invasion episode and the Mummy episode in Seasons 1 and 2, respectively. Oh yeah, there's ancient mummies here too, because, of, of course, there's also Bigfoot sightings, an episode about a missing dinosaur fossil, an asteroid sent by Daddy Big Bucks to destroy the city, and that doesn't even get me started on some of the characters, from a washed-up movie star seemingly based on Captain Kirk, to alien emperors, who each have a genuine place in the town. 
They don't all have importance in every single episode, but that's kind of what makes it start to feel like a real town. A lot of these characters cross over into the DS game too, with different personalities albeit, but I cannot tell you the noise that escaped from my mouth when I first encountered a robot named Optimum Alfred. Or the, the much less flattering noise when he made me pay him $5,000 to stop the asteroid slated to wipe out Earth. To call earning money in this game grindy is the understatement of all understatements. Even in the first proper episode, they make you spend $250 on a paddle ball to distract somebody. And remember, this is after we already didn't have enough money to buy all the basic items we needed to keep sane. The main money-making ventures in Sims 2 GBA are finding trash on the street and selling it, or nuclear fuel rods or alien spaceship parts if you can find them, which are worth more than trash. Other than that, as you explore the town, you'll find a handful of minigames, the same ones you'll do during some of the mid-episode commercial breaks. There's one for running from a murderous cola cup, there's scooping fresh manure into a tractor, and a lengthy casino card game, among many others. They're all simple and replayable to a degree, but you can only play each one once per in-game day, or every 15 or so minutes of real life time. Well, 15 would be ideal, but time doesn't progress during the minigames or conversations, so that's more like do all the minigames and then stand around waiting the extra 10 minutes to be able to make any money by repeating. You don't even make money by finishing episodes, you just get the ratings, and while you can earn promotions at these job minigames if you level up your skill stats, this is the only GBA Sims title where they removed the ability to buy skill-raising furniture that you could use forever. Instead, you just have to pay money to buy skill books, which again, just feeds into that constant grind for money and makes the house renovation stuff kind of useless. I just ended up restarting the nuclear accident episode over and over and grabbing all the loose fuel rods so that I could go to another episode and sell them. That was the fastest option I found, and if I hadn't done that, this game could have easily taken me another 10 plus hours of regular money grinding to beat every episode. Like the PSP game, The Sims 2 on GBA is worth looking at just for its wild dialogue and the really unique, irreplicable vibe that it has, and despite similar bones and gameplay, they both find very distinct ways to pull that off. Even the way they reference the fourth wall is wildly different, one forcing your character to keep that wall up at all times as part of the show's premise, the other essentially shaming you, the person, for being a psycho and bullying your sims in other games before. They both just kind of end, however. The three quote-unquote seasons don't have much structure to them that lines up or connects the episodes. The series finale does bring more closure than the PSP game at least, but it's still very abrupt all the same. I'm assuming probably because the studio was split across so many Sims games and so many other projects all at the same time, so again, half of the planned episodes made it in. In that finale, some of the town ends up finding out that their life is a TV show, and you can either side with them and overthrow Daddy Big Bucks by destroying all the cameras, or you can gaslight them. Thing is, I can't imagine this game with twice as many episodes, because it's already often drawn out as is. So many basic plot points are paywalled behind an item you need, or just straight up paying somebody off. And with how long it takes to earn money, doubling this game's length would be maybe a great value for kids out there who had this game, and only this game, in their life, not a single other video game. But it's not really an enjoyable game to play once the grind sets in. After the first couple hours, it's much more fun to talk about and marvel at the random plot points and objectives in a vacuum. Vacuuming, go figure, is a core mechanic in the DS version of The Sims 2, released on the same day as the GBA version, once again by the same studio, and although it does reuse a lot of characters, it couldn't be any further from the Game Boy game style. This one's almost a hybrid between the Game Boy and PSP games, with how much connecting tissue there is. The DS game opens up with your car breaking down in Strangetown, just like the PSP game, but here, Strangetown only has two notable areas, this patch of, like, four buildings and an irradiated desert that quickly drives any visitors insane. Since you need a place to stay, your sim tries to check into the Strangetown Hotel, only to be named its new manager by Mayor Honest Jackson. Again, great name, and immediately the same mob boss from the first episode of the GBA game moves in and starts having you handle his, let's call it, business. By the way, since this is a hotel management game and we're trying to get rich, my sim for once isn't a Kazuma, it's Akiyama. Huh? What? The 0.05% of you that understand this, th this one's for you. Even from the very start, with the bug-eye view of the opening cinematic, down to the either lack of music at times, or the soothing but also off-putting drone of the instruments alongside this up-tempo percussion, The Sims 2 on DS feels uncomfortable in kind of the best way. 
Something always feels off, whether it's the daytime music frequently blaring an alarm in the background, or the surprisingly high number of visitors and townsfolk that Strange Town sees any given day, despite there not being more than a couple beds in the city hall or bar. Who's driving here? How are they getting here? Who is the previous manager of this hotel and where did they end up? These aren't just oversights, these feel like the type of questions the game wants you to ask. One of Akiyama's first missions involves loading the hotel's nuclear reactor because, yeah, it has one of those, what about it? Why is there an alien manning the pawn shop? Is he at odds with the invading Emperor Zizzle and his army? When you hire the local handyman to start helping out with renovations, he laments that his girlfriend got carried off into the desert by scorpions. This is all stuff that's just kind of tossed at you in the first five minutes of this game. So the name of the game in this version of The Sims 2 is to build up your hotel by repairing and unlocking all of the guest rooms, checking folks in, managing their needs, keeping the hotel clean from the trash that piles up because your concierge won't do shit, and also handling your sanity meter and the special guest occupying the penthouse at that time. The sanity meter is the only semblance of your usual sim needs, sort of like in the GBA game, rather than having bathroom or sleep needs as different measurable statuses. As for the penthouse suite, until post-game it's locked to three story-specific characters. First it's the mobster Frankie Fusili, then it's the brooding Ava Cadavra who ends up trying to establish the cow cult in the basement, and then finally it's Optimum Alfred the Robot. All while you're dealing with the other hotel management stuff, these guys will frequently pester you with quests. Actually, it's kind of annoying dealing with them at the start and the end of quests, because after finishing one of the main missions here, you have to then leave the hotel for them to immediately call you and ask you to come meet them back in the penthouse. And if you wait more than a minute after that, they'll usually call you again. And again. And again. And again. When I say a minute or five minutes, by the way, that's not a figure of speech. This DS game takes place in real time using your DS's internal clock. When you buy a new building permit to renovate a room, it takes eight real life hours to finish. When you check in a guest, they'll tell you what day they're staying until, and if you want them to give you a good tip, you'd better log in during that checkout day's afternoon so that you can check them out in person. The shop, like in the GBA game, changes its inventory every day with secret items that can show up on certain days of the year, like the haunted ghost item, which only spawns a ghost on two specific days, one in 2000 and one in 2099. Skills can only be leveled up by finding skill points physically scattered throughout the world, and only specific ones show up at specific times of specific days in specific places, which can get kind of frustrating if you're not prepared for the game to suddenly require a high mechanical stat to beat the penultimate mission after pretty much never caring about the stats at any point in the story otherwise. The other skills do have use, don't get me wrong. The creativity and business stats earn you more money from art or from guests in general. Body skill is super helpful for slowing your sanity meter drain when you're out in the desert or in general, but mechanical actually has no purpose outside of that final skill check at the very end of the game. Some missions can only take place at night. Hell, the final mission requires you to play between 6 and 10 p.m. In a way, this game almost ends up feeling like a cross between your usual Animal Crossing styled games that operate in the same real-time manner, and a browser or proto-smartphone game where your buildings are produced with those long in-game wait times. So what do you do while you're waiting for 8 hours to pass? Well, you can talk to the guests or townsfolk and try to befriend or romance them, or just try to restrain them because they all frequently lose their minds in Strange Town. And this is the same sort of minigame as the other two Sims 2 versions, except this one requires you to read the NPC's animation and react with the correct option. If not that, you can mess around in some of the hotel rooms you've already built, whether it's adding and rearranging furniture to the hotel rooms, or playing the same pirate card game featured in the GBA game in the casino, drawing masterpieces in the art gallery, or producing music with a surprisingly feature-filled recording minigame. You can play one of the several fully featured arcade cabinets that take inspiration from classics like, fittingly, Space Invaders. If you're trying to put together some cash, you can scrounge the hotel, strange town, or the desert for fuel rods, gourds, license plates, or alien ship parts to sell to some of the vendors in town. Later, you even get a metal detector to find alien corpses, precious metal bars, and other items in the desert, at which point you can dissect those aliens in the secret government lab underneath the hotel, assuming you've built it already, because yes, you can just build one of those here. Or if you've unlocked the superhero den, you can try to fight crime as the Raticator. That, yeah, that's a thing too. There are a number of random events that'll occur. The guests will ask you for a specific item or text you to let you know that they've bought one of your paintings. There's a lot of busy work in The Sims 2 DS, assuming that busy work is what you want.
Or you can just close your DS for a few hours and, I don't know, touch grass. Or more likely than that, because we're on YouTube, I know you, you can skip your in-game clock ahead and avoid all of that stop and start. Just don't go back in time if you do, because you'll get an angry message from the concierge, sometimes it'll kick off a full alien invasion, and either way, as punishment, you'll be stuck walking super slowly for a good amount of time, similar to what happens when you get abducted in the desert and probed by aliens. You're doing the prostate exam walk of pain. The game could easily take you a month or more to beat what's otherwise a short few hours worth of main story, after which point you're just in the postgame, putting together the perfect hotel rooms and simply managing the hotel. Let's jump back to that story though, because much of the lauding that you'll see online from Sims 2 DS aficionados, and part of the reason the game even has aficionados, and why this game is brought up surprisingly often with this much reverence that stands out even when put next to the loud Sims console era enjoyers or the My Sims fans, much of that comes from this game going wild into any direction that it wants. I personally don't think it has a story quite to the insane level of The Sims PSP, but I think the atmosphere of this one raises things up almost as high in a different way. Many of the characters end up reused from the GBA game, like I've said before, but this time around they might only appear as one of the hotel guests. Where everybody in that Game Boy version had at least part of an episode dedicated to them, where you could talk to them and learn a little bit about them, here you can just have a character like Jimmy the Neck show up after Frankie Fusili forces you to hide counterfeit money in the hotel basement, and he doesn't have any character or any conversation pieces besides being the guy watching that money. Same goes for the alien Emperor Zizzle. He raids the hotel not even 10 minutes into the game, but after that, he's pretty much gone unless you start tweaking your DS's clock or run into one of those random encounters. It's kind of part of what makes this entire game feel off. These random characters that seem filled to the brim with story, but those stories are just never told to you. It's like that person you see at a bar who's clearly lived a fascinating life. You just kind of have to wonder, or if you're a kid and haven't gone to bars yet, you create your own stories in your head for this game's NPCs. Some of Frankie's tasks for you involve giving a package that's very clearly a bomb to the mayor, which immediately explodes, or building different rooms as fronts for his laundering schemes, or eventually burying a strange briefcase in the desert, a briefcase that's moving and thumping and screaming at you. This part is where the FBI stops you, makes you wear a wire, and then books Fasili for his crimes. But I mention it because even this game's glitches add to its aura. The suitcase obviously has somebody inside it that Fusili's trying to whack, right? Well, the mayor that he's been antagonizing at this exact point in time disappears from the game forever. It turns out to just be a bug that wasn't caught before the game shipped, but it fits so well that you would just have to think that this mobster offed the mayor until you know otherwise. And because it's a glitch, that is never acknowledged by any other character which, again, further adds to the why does nobody else notice what I'm noticing stuff. The second act of the game with Ava Kedavra isn't really all that noteworthy outside of accidentally summoning an ancient Egyptian emperor in the desert after having started the ritual to summon Beelzebeef. What, what a sentence. Uh, not noteworthy. Beelzebeef. Egyptian emperor. Whew. Oh, also, the desert just has the moonlander on it. Never acknowledged. It's just right there next to the, the pool of radioactive soup. Act 3 after this reveals the game's final boss, Optimum Alfred, who shows up at first pretending to want to help, getting our hero Akiyama to give him a bunch of fuel cells, nuclear fuel cells remember, for his new power charger, a satellite dish on the roof, and other items clearly intended to help him take over the world before he hijacks the elevator access and starts unveiling his plan. That last part also means that for the first time in this game, you're not constantly going up and down the elevator to trigger the next mission immediately after finishing the prior one, no, now he rides the elevator down himself just just to talk shit. Uh, honestly, incredible. It's around this point that you team up with the returning Emperor Zizzle, who just hasn't shown up since that very start of the game, and the Mole King, who isn't even explained whatsoever, so imagine my shock when he suddenly appears to help you cut some wires with his teeth in the third to last mission and then disappears forever? Yeah, that threw me off. I realize all of this ends up sounding a bit tame after talking about the GBA game, almost because that version adds texture to some of the characters that the DS version simply never gets. Like, yeah, if you hit max friend level with somebody, they do have one single secret in a dialed back version of the PSP game secrets mechanic, but otherwise, this game thrives off of the stuff that it doesn't say. It performs its best when isolated from the Sims series. Having the GBA game as a context for characterization and whatnot, even if the stories aren't related and this is a whole parallel universe or whatever, it actually kind of harms the DS game, oddly enough. And to be fair, I haven't dug into the Raticator superhero persona you take on at the end of the game to uh, fight Alfred and his robot clones. Th this one, this one, I I've got 
I have nothing. This just happens, and it's how the game ends. Akiyama becomes great value Batman, pushes a robot into a pool, and then prowls the night to protect Strange Town forever, I, I guess. And to be clear, the order in which I played these three games was PSP, then DS, then GBA. So all of this absolutely did hit me in a way that it did for so many other players back in the day. Saving the craziest stuff for last here in video form just does that crazy a little bit of a disservice is all, so I wanted to clarify. I was laughing at times at how absurd things get, with how plot points are just dropped on a dime to move on to a new villain that just moves right into the penthouse. I was genuinely a little weirded out for a couple brief moments here in there just because the music hit at just the right point, either as I was exploring the damp basement or using the metal detector in the desert at night. I don't think I would call the game all that good, in part because there's a significant grind in waiting for the rooms to even be finished, or even the early grind for money before you've opened up more than one guest room. But I want to be clear that all of this absurdity absolutely does not seem like it's the result of the game just not being designed well. From what some of the developers have said in the past, they went all out trying to pack The Sims 2 on DS with weird or dare I say unsettling elements. And it leads me to believe that even the sudden jumps in the story are manifests of that goal. The fact that even a glitch like Mayor Jackson disappearing forever can feed into the legend that is The Sims 2 DS, it, it speaks volumes about how well the game did at being something special and memorable. In the same breath, this game having this protracted play a little bit and then wait a day only to get another simple mission that takes like two minutes to finish and then be forced to wait another day, drip feed style of storytelling, is something that would only add to that if you were playing this game back in 2005. It's not something I did, I mean screw that, I've got bills to pay, and I fully acknowledge that skipping ahead like most people did do back in the day and are now going to pretend that they didn't, that does risk taking away some of that long term replayability. It makes the game appear shallower than it might truly be. I also think doing this helps make it more digestible though. It opens up a world where I can recommend you play this game, even if you're time traveling or emulating or speeding the game up, because there's just no way I feel I can do the game justice with words alone, and I know that pretty much anybody I would recommend this game to isn't gonna sit there and say, oh yeah, I'll just play this game every day for a month. We don't need more battle passes in life, sorry when played more traditionally on your terms rather than maybe the game's terms, this is a game that I think should be experienced by anybody interested in the weird side of licensed ports of sorts. Of the three Sims 2 handheld games here, I definitely enjoyed the PSP game the most, even if the promise the GBA game showed could have maybe taken it to greater heights with a stronger execution. The DS game is its, it's just in its own world where I don't even know how to rate it as a game too. And yet, I kind of recommend all three together, almost? Seeing the pieces from one game make it into each of the others was one of the most fun parts of putting this video together, and it only made me appreciate even more the impossible task that the studio had in developing three wildly different games with the same name, all set to release at about the same time. We don't get those wacky ports anymore, where a publisher like EA seemingly just doesn't even check before greenlighting it and moving along. It's part of why we'll almost certainly never again see a Sims game anywhere near as wild as these three. If you're a Sims fan, or you like any of those weird gaming oddities or games that develop their own legends and creepypastas and stuff like that, I suggest giving any or all of these three games a shot. Now. Please, God, don't make me play the handheld My Sims games. No, no more. Please. Hey, put your name on this list of awesome patrons and you can get early ad-free access to videos just like this, access to the Golden Bolt Discord, and if you're super special, I might even just say your name like these fine folks. Rodney220, The Critic of Innocence, Thomas Kuzma, Cranky, Jump Rock, Common CJ, Karatana, and so many more. Thank you.